your commitment to addressing these issues in San Diego. And I, of course, I've had the uh, pleasure of working with San Diego courts for you know over 20 years on a variety of issues when I was at the Judicial Council and subsequently in your self-help center and family court services. So uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today. So, you know, just to start out and build on what has already been mentioned, this is not easy work. Uh, you are engaged in some very uh, important work uh, and some work that can be very traumatizing for those of us who are in it. I always thought when I was younger, I started this work in my early 20s, that somehow it would get easier. But in fact, as I've uh, my career has developed over the last 30 years, it is uh, just layer upon layer of the stories and the challenges. Uh, lots of steps forward, sometimes a few steps back, but we know that people are under a lot of stress, not only those who come into the legal system, but also those who spend our time in the legal system. So just want to acknowledge that and uh, suggest that as you're listening, uh, and, and I know trying to be engaged, I know it's easy to multitask when we're in these trainings and, and remote. I encourage you to give this as much attention as you can possibly. And also think about how you can position yourself to be able to take this in and take good care. I think having some water nearby, um, I like to draw or doodle while um, I'm listening sometimes and it actually helps me pay more attention. And of course, to take deep breaths, because this is really, really hard, I think. We can throw around numbers and we can talk about legal policies and we know we're talking about our own fears as well as real tragedies and stories for all the people who have come through our offices and through our lives. So we'll, we'll get through it. Um, I, for me, being in community and being inspired is really uh, important. Um, I'm privileged enough to work for Giffords Law Center, which is part of the Giffords organization, which was founded by Gabby Giffords and her husband, Senator Mark Kelly, now Senator. Um, they originally founded the DC-based uh, C4 lobbying arm. Um, after Gabby Giffords experienced her own uh, shooting, when she was shot as part of a mass shooting in Tucson, uh, where 18 people were injured um, and uh, many died. Gabby survived that shooting and uh, went on to, uh, as I hope most know, uh, continue to advocate for gun safety policies. She and her husband, Mark, gun owners themselves, started Americans for Responsible Solutions. And meanwhile, here in San Francisco, after a tragic shooting in 1991, at uh, a law firm in downtown San Francisco, uh, there was an organization formed uh, uh, at the center uh, focused on uh, gun violence prevention. And that group of lawyers then merged in about 2016, 2017 with Gabby and Mark's organization to form what's now Giffords. So I'm inspired regularly uh, by Gabby and her commitment to move forward and to uh, approach this area with common sense. Uh, the majority of Americans support common sense gun safety policies, and I'll be covering the work that we've all been engaged in and others before me in California uh, today. So let me um, just get a little bit into some defini definitions. Uh, this is an average number. We know that uh, gun violence is a major public health and legal problem in our country. Last year, the estimates were around 41,000 Americans died as a result of gun violence. Gun violence is defined as including, for these purposes, gun suicides, death by suicide involving a firearm, homicides, which themselves include domestic violence homicides, as well as uh, the unfortunate community violence, sometimes referred to as urban gun violence or everyday gun violence in our country, law enforcement shootings, unintentional shootings and some number of undetermined. But you can see uh, for a lot of folks, a, a better recognition of the role that suicide plays in our gun violence in, in the US is important. Uh, we are doing this work, of course, in the context of recognizing that we stand out in the United States uh, as having the vastly higher number of private gun ownership than any other country in the world. There's no one even close. Um, and there is a culture that supports uh, 
maintaining gun ownership, often, unfortunately, even in the face of danger um, or uh, experiences that one would think may result in a prohibition or a, a denial of access to new firearms. Um, and I think this comes up very often in the context of domestic violence. For those of you who've been doing domestic violence prevention or intervention work for a long time, you know that there is often a tendency to minimize the significance of domestic violence. It often happens, of course, in private. There's a lot of shame and terrorism around not talking to anyone about it. Uh, and even when people hint at it or share more details, not everybody understands how potentially lethal or harmful domestic violence is. So part of what I hope to do with these presentations is to um, elevate everyone's understanding of the intersection of domestic violence and firearms, how lethal and dangerous it is, uh, and also push back a bit on this notion that somehow, well, you know, if the relationship ends, if they're separated now, uh, if they're co-parenting, uh, a prohibition may not be necessary. Uh, and it may not be, but that doesn't mean gun violence isn't a potential problem. Uh, Claudia has already mentioned uh, some of the key statistics, so I will just further emphasize that uh, not only are we talking about lethal outcomes and injuries in the United States, we're also talking about the fact that over a million women are alive today who have been shot or shot at. Uh, domestic violence plays a critical role in uh, mass shootings as well. If you define mass shootings as a situation in which three or more people are killed, the vast majority of mass shootings actually occur within the home. So we often think about them happening tragically in schools or other public settings, but we know many people are losing their lives in these um, situations in which an entire family uh, might uh, uh, end up with a lethal outcome, uh, very much connected to a history of domestic violence. And again, just to put a finer point on why suicide is included and how important it is, the difference between suicide where firearms are involved is that we know that if we can remove that uh, weapon, if we can take firearms out of the equation, we can prevent many more deaths. We can prevent outcomes uh, that result in severe injury or loss of life. So some of the other ways that people might uh, attempt suicide or uh, engage in suicidal ideation um, are less likely to be successful, frankly. But a firearm so often has a lethal outcome that if we can reduce the risk by removing firearms, we can see great improvement. Another uh, statistic I, I um, think is important to include is how many children are living in homes in which guns are not properly stored. We'd like to assume that most gun owners are safe and responsible with their firearms, but the reality is that too many children are in situations in which guns are not properly stored. And of course, that's relevant in terms of safety planning, right? The domestic violence movement has done a fabulous job for decades now promoting the notion of safety planning. There is not one remedy. Not every domestic violence case uh, requires or uh, necessitates a restraining order. In some cases that could increase risk unnecessarily. Uh, there are other ways to work with people to address firearms risk, including talking about the need to safely store firearms because when there is a crisis in the home, children may be unsupervised, they may be experiencing depression, uh, there may be a certain level of chaos in the home that can result in unintentional suicide. We want to prevent youth uh, unintentional shootings. We want to prevent youth suicides. Um, so we really want to see that number change as well. So talking about understanding the need for safe storage, and I have plenty of resources on this as well that um, you can uh, reach out to me. Um, you have a ton of handouts also uh, that uh, I know were distributed. So there's a lot of good material given our short uh, amount of time. I won't be able to go into detail on a lot of this, but want to first give you a background and then jump into the legal issues as well. Um, another aspect of gun violence includes what I mentioned is community violence, urban violence, uh, and uh, police involved shootings. Why is that relevant to domestic violence? A number of reasons. First, we have to recognize that not everybody has the trust and confidence in law enforcement or our courts that uh, is required uh, 
uh, if people are going to envision themselves getting a restraining order or even contacting the police and pursuing or being involved with a criminal matter. So we have to be aware that there's a need for a variety of resources or a variety of legal remedies. Um, and we have to simultaneously address the issues around bias um, and increase community police trust and increase the confidence that uh, the community can have in our court system. So every day that all of us who do this work within the legal system uh, address folks who may be struggling with some of these issues, every day we have an opportunity to address that reality. But because of that, we can't just assume that everyone's gonna call 911 or that everyone's gonna get a restraining order or that everyone's gonna want to participate in a criminal legal process. So we need to provide alternatives or options for people as part of that safety planning effort. In California in particular, uh, some statistics that I think are important uh, that nearly 50% of California's intimate partner homicides involve a gun, that young people report experiencing domestic violence as one of their earliest forms of uh, experiencing violence in their lives. There's a wonderful group of people in the state out of Policy Link and the Alliance of Boys and Men of Color who've produced something called Healing Together, and I'm part of those monthly conversations. Um, and the Healing Together uh, work was developed because in working with young men of color around community violence and asking them what their earliest memory was of violence, they often reported that it was seeing their mother be harmed by her boyfriend or their father. So we know there's a direct connection between community violence and domestic violence, and there's a real cost to all of this as well. And the reality is a gun may never be fired, may never be used to uh, wound someone physically, but it is, uh, can often play a role, firearms can often play a role in coercive control. Uh, just the fact that the firearm is in the equation is enough to uh, control and abuse uh, a victim survivor in that kind of situation. I've worked on several cases where uh, survivors have told me he just puts the gun on the table or I know he has a cache of guns. I know he's connected to people with firearms. Uh, there isn't a lot I can do to protect myself or my children. Can you help me deal with that? So this is a, a very um, concerning reality. In the middle of the pandemic, as Claudia has also referenced, we've seen an uptick in background checks, significant uptick in background checks. These are numbers for California. 83% uh, uptick from March through September. We're still looking at the numbers that are coming in later in the year, um, which means higher gun sales. Often we think first time gun owners, but we don't know for sure, which means there may be limitations in terms of experience with those firearms. And we've seen an increase over the years in calls for assistance to law enforcement, right? From 867 to 1,388 over the last nine years or so. Um, so we know that this is a, a increasing problem rather than a decreasing problem. I was also asked to talk a little bit about ghost guns, uh, which is a significant issue here nationally and here in California. Um, I've heard reports that about 30% or so of guns that are being collected in the kind of criminal raids or um, events that uh, Dave mentioned and that um, we know regularly occur in this state it may involve crime guns or uh, ghost guns. So the, the term ghost gun is a, a reference to uh, the fact that these are guns that may not be, um, include all parts of a gun. It may include pieces of a gun manufactured through 3D printers, sold just in parts on the internet, um, and do not have a serial number, which makes them very difficult to trace. So not only is there no background check, because there isn't going to be a background check if you're uh, buying a part of a gun or pieces of it in a kit to put together, um, but also without that serial number, it makes tracing the gun very difficult. And there's a little chart here on this slide that shows you, uh, for those who may not be familiar in the ATF context, sort of a, a very simplified version of the importance of being able to trace uh, firearms to understand when the licensed firearm dealer may have sold it and to whom. Uh, we have law now in California that requires application for and assignment of serial numbers. Um, uh, they've sped up the implementation date. 
Uh, that information can be obtained through Department of Justice. And like I said, you have a handout in your materials on that. We could do a whole presentation on that uh, topic, but I just wanted to alert you to this other area in which firearms um, are significant in our state. Okay, so into all of this, what are some answers? California, thanks to some of the good work that's gone on at the Law Center long before I showed up, many other activists and advocates in the state and some um, excellent leaders. We have what I like to talk about as a pretty robust toolkit in California. Because of this diverse uh, set of uh, types of gun violence, that gun violence shows up in different ways, different sets of facts, we need to have as many tools available to us as possible. Um, it's uh, As an attorney, I like to remind people that it really isn't appropriate when someone says, I'm concerned that so-and-so has a firearm to say, aha, that means they have to be arrested, or that means they have to go into psychiatric treatment, or that means they have to get a gun violence restraining order. These are all different tools that can provide prohibitions against firearm ownership, purchase, um, control. They can also, in some instances, provide services and other remedies. So we're lucky enough under state law to have a variety of tools at our fingertips. Um, and Jeff Booker, who I work with regularly, is um, you're very lucky to hear from him today. He'll be talking about the gun violence restraining order in particular. So I'm not going to spend any time on that. But I'm just going to note, and you have a chart that uh, kind of looks like this in your materials, the civil restraining order chart that goes into a little bit more detail about civil restraining orders. We have had firearm prohibitions in the civil restraining order context for um, a couple of decades now. Uh, the gun violence restraining order is the newest version of that civil restraining order, and it does one thing, which is limit access to firearms and ammunition. Very important. Um, the domestic violence restraining order, elder abuse restraining order, civil harassment order, workplace violence prevention orders also all have uh, those prohibitions in place. Um, and not only require that you relinquish any existing firearms that you own, but also prohibit you during the time that the restraining order is in place, like the gun violence restraining order, from being able to purchase uh, weapons and ammunition. And there are very particular procedures for that that I'll briefly go into. Um, similarly, we have prohibitions in the criminal context, pretrial with a criminal protective order, after convictions when someone may be on probation, and I've included a chart there from DOJ, uh, the Department of Justice here in California, that goes through all the different types of prohibitions, um, both under state law and federal law. You'll also be familiar with the 5150 statutes under Welfare and Institutions Code Section 5150 at SEC. Um, and there's a lot of confusion about the limitations there. It does require that you be admitted, evaluated, uh, spend a certain amount of time in the facility. Um, those prohibitions are also in place, but not always utilized or well understood, but important to know about. So I encourage you to check out that Department of Justice list that I've shared with you um, and to let me know if you have any questions. All of the civil restraining order prohibitions go into effect at the time that the emergency protective order is issued or obtained by law enforcement. We have two kinds of emergency protective orders in California, EPO 001 which covers domestic violence, child abduction, um, and stalking. And we have uh, the EPO 002, which deals with the gun violence restraining order. Two different EPOs, both of which pro uh, prohibit access to firearms and ammunition. If you don't start at the EPO process, at uh, the EPO point, you might start at the temporary restraining order point or the ex parte point, also prohibitions. That differs from federal law. Under federal law, those prohibitions are not in place until there's an order after hearing, okay? So this is a excerpt from the emergency protective order form in California. The Judicial Council is uh, under our constitution responsible for creating the forms that are utilized in our state for these proceedings. And you'll see there is a notice. It's not a checkbox, it's automatic in all emergency protective orders uh, that you cannot have firearms. Um, and there's instructions about what you need to do, that you have to sell or store your firearm, provide it to a law enforcement agency, 
Um, and if you don't comply, this in and of itself is a crime, a violation of the order. Before there is a hearing uh, in family court where you have a civil order of protection, um, the court is required to do a search under what's called Family Code Section 6306. This is true both in the domestic violence restraining order context and in the GVRO context. And the court, it needs to be looking at some key information. And I raise this because if you're an advocate or someone in a position to uh, make sure this is happening, it's important to check in and ensure that the court is getting this key information, um, which includes looking into a registry that we have in the state that would indicate whether they have a registered firearm. Of course, it doesn't take care of unregistered firearms, but at least knowing whether there is a registered firearm, if they have a misdemeanor conviction involving domestic violence, weapons, or other violence, key information that can help reduce risk prior to issuing, issuing a restraining under, uh, order under the family code. Some additional um, procedures uh, that are really important. Um, the, at the time that the law enforcement would be serving the order, the emergency protective order, which they obtain by contacting the on-call duty judge or magistrate, they need to indicate whether uh, firearms were seen, searched for, seized, um, otherwise identified, and that point that person becomes prohibited once they have that information and they're expected to remove, ask for those firearms. In a domestic violence case, they're expected to say, do you have firearms? Give me your firearms. If the person doesn't comply at that point, they are in violation of the emergency protective order. Um, however, they also have the option of if the person doesn't ask or they don't turn them over, there's a, some confusion in this area, they have 24 hours to turn over those firearms, relinquish them, and 48 hours to provide a receipt to the court. Um, the petition itself asks about firearms. Uh, I, can, uh, for those of you working with uh, those who are filling out um, restraining order petitions, having uh, uh, photos in order to describe them more effectively can be helpful. Not for the court so much, that's a whole different issue, but even in your office to say, is this the kind of firearm that you've seen the other person with? Is this what this looks like? Because not everybody can describe them um, in the kind of detail that can be useful to the judge. Um, if the TRO uh, or an order after hearing is served by law enforcement, again, they must ask for the firearms, just like they were supposed to at the EPO stage, doing that at the temporary restraining order phase, or if they're serving an order after hearing, they are required to ask if the person doesn't turn them over and they have been served, they are, are considered to be in violation. If they don't take action at that point, they have 24 hours, 48 hours to turn the receipt in both to law enforcement, if law enforcement served the order, and to the court. Not turning those receipts in, that's a violation of the restraining order. So you can also be charged for violating the restraining order for that reason, okay? In the criminal context, we would hope that prosecutors, hopefully even criminal defense attorneys, public defenders, and the judge uh, need to really be in a position to be assisting with getting information to the restrained party in a pretrial release situation. If there's a criminal protective order, ensure that those firearms that may currently be in possession of the defendant are relinquished. Sometimes probation can help with that after conviction as well. Um, and any of these violations in and of themselves could be misdemeanors or they could be felonies. Again, it depends. Now, in just the last uh, couple minutes on the legal piece, um, I was asked to talk a little bit about federal law. Interestingly enough, in California, federal law is relevant in terms of full faith and credit. That is, a restraining order from out of state needs to be honored in our state, in part because of federal law requirements. Um, it's certainly relevant in terms of understanding that someone could be prohibited as a result of a state law and also as because of a federal law. Sometimes that prohibition will be lengthier under federal law. Sometimes it'll be the reverse. So, uh, for example, under federal law, like I mentioned, there isn't a prohibition during the time the uh, emergency protective order is in place. But in California, that prohibition is in place and that goes into the national database. So just because you're prohibited in California doesn't mean you are not prohibited in another state. 
that gets into a longer conversation about background checks, but you become a prohibited person nationally uh, in most instances, uh, even if it's under state law. But federal law is uh, just important to note also uh, because you know, under federal law, uh, conviction of domestic, of domestic violence misdemeanor um, is a prohibiting event. And it is one of the more significant ways that people end up being prohibited nationally. So again, on your handout, you'll see different types of prohibitions. This means that somebody who's a restraining order, they stop being restrained. They may no longer be prohibited under the restraining order. You don't just get your firearms. You're gonna have to petition um, and indicate that you are now living without any prohibitions. And you may in fact not be able to demonstrate that if you're prohibited under federal law. Okay, so that was a quick run through. And the last piece I'm just gonna touch on, hopefully allowing a couple minutes if there are questions, um, implementation and resources. How do we get all of this done in California to the best of our ability? Um, certainly we have a lot of the policies in place, ensuring that those who are uh, prohibited actually relinquish, surrender their firearms, ensuring that those who appear on domestic violence calendars and family law calendars and allege domestic violence, that judges take that seriously, that we all take that seriously. Um, sometimes again, the uh, misunderstandings of the uh, significance of domestic violence may result in denials of requests for restraining orders, uh, which again, doesn't allow the prohibition to remain in place if there had been an EPO or even a TRO, a temporary restraining order. Um, and we minimize the risk, unfortunately. So we, we need to do more work on that. When um, I was at the Judicial Council working on domestic violence restraining order forms when the gun violence restraining order came about, and um, it was fascinating to me to learn how few people understood that we have had longstanding prohibitions around firearms in the domestic violence space uh, that have not been fully implemented. and. Um, when we only take away the firearms and we don't address the domestic violence, uh, we are not necessarily increasing safety enough or reducing risk enough. So we have to look at those other 20 plus remedies that are available in the domestic violence restraining order context as one aspect of safety planning. It might be in conjunction with the GVRO, and I'll let Jeff talk about that, could be in conjunction with a criminal case. Um, there could be a number of different things that are put into place. So we have um, a, a, a bill out there now, SB 320 by a Senator Eggman that would take existing rule of court 5.495 that requires that if the person hasn't turned in that receipt, there's gonna be a hearing possibly on the calendar. That's one way of doing this. The court is given some flexibility um, to say, hey, where's your receipt? So you get multiple multiple bites of the apple, so to speak. Turn in your firearms at the EPO, turn them in at the TRO, turn them in at the order after hearing, provide the receipt, provide information to restrain parties so they know how to comply. But when they don't, we're gonna have to take that seriously because uh, to continue to maintain firearms um, in the face of that prohibition does uh, a great disservice to all of the good work that's gone on in the state to develop the policies and actually act on them in the court context. Um, we wanna make sure that survivors feel like they can get good information, ask good questions and have the uh, trust and confidence to let us know when there may be a risk. Uh, the universal background check effort is ongoing, certainly with the current administration. There's a lot of interest at the federal level by universal background checks. We mean background checks in all contexts, private sales and so forth much of which we have in California, um, but as long as the rest of the country allows for uh, greater flexibility in that area, we're, we're at risk as well. Um, and the kind of education and training we're doing today. I wanted to highlight DV 800 info. The Judicial Council has a lot of info sheets available in multiple languages at the website noted here, courts.ca.gov and you can look for the rules and forms button at the top, click on that. There's a DV 800 info, there's a GV for gun violence restraining orders, um, 800 info. There's one in the juvenile context, 252 info. 
This is information for the restrained party. And of course, that's a critical component of the, the safety planning here, right? That the, in, the restrained party gets good information at the local level about how they can comply. How do they turn in those firearms to a law enforcement agency? Where do they turn that receipt in? We've got to make it as easy as possible for people to do the right thing. So this is an important information sheet and there's an, a, a DV 800 form that allows that person to provide the proof directly to the court. So I draw your attention to that. It's often on the second page when you look at forms lists. So not everybody knows it's available. And then a couple more resources, recommendations, ask key questions. I've included in your handout some key questions for victim survivors, for people you may be working with. Don't assume that they're gonna bring up that there are firearms in the home or that the person they're concerned about has access to firearms. Uh, just include that if you aren't already in your regular screening process. Um, some of us, depending on our own experience with firearms, may assume everyone has them and they're safe or nobody has them um, or you know, only people who have a criminal background have access to firearms. This crosses socioeconomic status, race, gender, age, there are a lot of guns out there right now. Um, and it's important to be in a position to push information out about that risk because many people may not be thinking about how the crisis they're in, the conflict they're dealing with can contribute to lethal or otherwise problematic tragic outcomes. Um, so that uh, handout you have in your materials provides some key questions. Um, and one of the first ones is, do you feel safe telling me whether there are firearms involved in your relationship or the person you're concerned about. Not even just are there firearms, but do you feel safe telling me? Because people who are under this kind of threat may not feel safe telling you, and that in and of itself is a red flag. We've also produced a pocket-sized brochure that we can mail to anyone for free. It's in English, Spanish, and simplified Chinese characters, uh, Mandarin, uh, available statewide. It highlights state and national resources, including contacting your local 211 to get information about local mental health resources, um, going to court, contacting an attorney, uh, making a safety plan, contacting the National Domestic Violence Hotline or the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So it provides a range of options for you. And you can reach me at J. Weber with one B, jweber at giffords.org. It's on uh, your handout as well. And we can ship those out to you. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously these are better for in-person activities, which uh, are, are limited at this point. But to the extent people are seeing people in emergency situations, this kind of brochure may be useful. And then we have a couple of other resources on the site, a couple of blog posts, you know, working with the courts during coronavirus. Um, and uh, I've been doing some writing about why the pandemic, as has already been noted, um, poses additional risks uh, around firearms and domestic violence. So you can check out our uh, website there and see if there's anything of interest. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to just jump right in. I'm really squeezed for time here and to try to explain what gun violence restraining orders are and how they apply could take hours and hours. So this is going to be a, a true bird's eye view of what uh, GBRO is and, and how it can be applied in the different facets of implementation and enforcement. So we're going to start off with the, uh, the basics here. It, it's a civil court order that's essentially filed by, um, in my capacity, by the police department. The San Diego Police Department is a party to the action. They are the petitioner. They will file a court order, for a court order, restricting another person from either taking custody, controlling, possessing or purchasing, um, or receiving both firearms and ammunition. So it's pretty much in a, in a broad stroke, any situation where a person has access to a firearm. Now, how is it applied? That This is probably one of the most interesting areas because people think it has to be a threat or it has to be some sort of instance of gun violence, but truly it's any red flag where a GVRO could be applied because this legal standard here is not whether they pose a threat with a gun. 
the legal standard is do they pose a danger to self or others and that's it and if that standard can be met by any any such a broad spectrum of indicia to to demonstrate danger then a gvro can be obtained for example any kind of family violence or stalking Substance abuse is a big one when you have the uh, people that are hooked on meth or heroin and also possess uh, firearms. Any kind of suicide would apply and the harm to self. There's a lot of uh, mental health cases, which includes dementia and PTSD, where we get these and these often stem from 5150s or crimes involving the uh, mental health as the genesis of the uh, crime itself. Any kind of school shooting, workplace shooting, that goes unsaid. Uh, and then finally, at the end, there's social media threats. There's been a huge increase in those since the advent of COVID, along with suicide and mental health that we've seen. Um, <clears throat> any kind of threat of mass violence and another sort of uh, COVID-created category that we have seen, not only us, but also it's been huge in Riverside, is the domestic terrorism aspect uh, where GVROs have been applied. And we've applied a number of those on behalf of our federal partners um, at the local level uh, through the different agencies at the LACC or the task forces that have both a, a federal and state uh, nexus all together in one room. So where do they come from? They pretty much come from anywhere. As long as you can illustrate and articulate a danger, then you know um, you can probably obtain a GVRO. The other thing that's interesting about this slide is, you know, mental health, because that's often talked about, you know, as a prosecutor, it's often a mitigant for a crime. It, either it doesn't meet the requisite specific intent requirement because of a mental health diagnosis, which can result in not filing of cases, reduced pleas, dismissals, but in the gun violence restraining order realm, um, a mental health aggravant, it becomes more of an aggravant to the danger uh, than it is a mitigant. Uh, in the prosecution. So that's just kind of an inverse way of looking at that. Um, and prosecuting crimes for so many years, um, it, was, it was refreshing to finally say, hey, yeah, the, the person who has this diagnosis, this is actually what makes him more dangerous and not less culpable as we are used to. The other kind of myth is that everyone thinks you need a gun to do a GVRO and you really don't. Um, part of the gaining access to includes the ability to purchase. And so there are cases where we filed, on, you know, for example, if I say I'm going to shoot somebody and it's documented and it's, and I'm, and I really intend it and I mean it, what's going to happen, you can file a GVRO against me to prevent me from going and purchasing a gun. One of the first cases we had was a, a, a male victim in a domestic violence situation where no crime was going to be filed at any level, misdemeanor, felony, or otherwise, where uh, upon the frustration of the victim talking to the prosecutor and the police said, I'm just going to go buy a gun and shoot her at this point. They were also going through a divorce and, and it was a rough situation. So what do you do when that kind of a red flag is documented so well? He never owned a firearm in his life. He didn't possess one at the time, but this is not the kind of situation where 11 days later, we're walking into a domestic violence, uh, homicide, suicide situation when he stated his intention pretty clear. Um, that's an extreme situation, of course, and it is anecdotal, I'll give you that. But at the same time, there are many cases where threats to kill with firearms are made, documented, set through social media, uh, even though they don't have or possess a gun the GVRO will prevent the purchase. A couple of stats real quick on uh, what we've done since 2000, January 2018. Our overall number for firearms seized uh, 752 to date. Um, it's probably a little higher now because this was done about a month ago and we did have a busy month last month, but that's 90 shotguns, 172 rifles, long rifles, 62 assault rifles, um, five collectibles and 26 unknown type. People always ask, what is unknown type? Well, that means when the police department booked it in with their receipt and the evidence, which is where we draw our information from, they did not put a type, they just put firearms. So we are looking into those one at a time. As far as the uh, firearms that we've seized, you'll see that we got over half of them, 460, to be precise, in just the year 2020 alone. Um, that's, uh, that's a testament to two things, I think. One, 
the awareness by the police department that they have this tool and their uh, application in using it has ballooned as the word has spread and as more and more police officers have done them successfully uh, it becomes uh, it becomes sort of contagious and then they start doing them in situations where they see versus a couple of years ago when no one really knew what these were there were very few filed i think uh in addition to the uh, awareness aspect of it the covid sort of blew this up as well too because there was so much there were so many fewer contacts between police officers and members of the public in the field so the mental health the suicide um, a lot of the uh, uh, types of crimes that police were contacting that involved violence without contact they were able to file a GVRO on instead not have to worry about the crime situation <laughs> Now, how many have we filed uh, since 2018? The key number here is looking at line two, where you'll see how many people have we prohibited, 574. Now, when you see the 850 number at the top, judicially approved, uh, I didn't want to put that up there without caveating that. So what that is, is there's actually two restraining orders independently submitted to a judge per one respondent. One is either an ex parte, type and then it goes to hearing or it's an EPO type and then it goes to hearing. Now each type of GVRO has a different legal standard, uh, different, different evidentiary considerations and it's reviewed um, without looking at the other one if, they, if it comes second in turn, if that makes sense. It's a lot more complicated than that but I'm trying to be brief and just kind of give you broad strokes like I said. So when people ask how many have you done, it can, be, can, be, it can become a uh, a difficult question to answer. 850 judicially approved, put them for a judge with arguments. Um, how many have we filed on? 574 people. LRAs, of, of those numbers, LRA, that's a lesser restrictive alternative. Those are essentially cases we've negotiated. For example, just buy a safe and, and we'll give you your gun back and the dangerous situation will be averted or take it gun safety class. So when you actually shot yourself in the hand uh, while you were drinking, we will know that you actually know how to use and hold your gun. These fall into situations where people aren't necessarily committing criminal conduct, uh, just people who made a mistake with their gun that put themselves or other people at risk. So we end up uh, doing the lesser restrictive alternative to a GVRO. 98, we have dismissed after one successful filing, we've dismissed for lack of service in order to uh, do a permanent hearing. And um, 33, we've dismissed upon the changing of the landscape, for example, the burden, burden of proof, where we will, more information will come in between the EPO and the date of the hearing. And we will then essentially uh, look at it with it through a different lens and the police department will decide that we don't need to do a hearing, everything's okay. The crime case intersection is another uh, um, topic here because people often ask, how does this affect the crime case? What happens to the crime case? And um, as I kind of briefly mentioned, the petitioner itself is a police agency. And this is how these differ from DVROs or civil harassment orders. The police department itself, the agency, is a party to the action. So if you get a DV restraining order, you don't have to worry about the recantation or the wanting to give the uh, aggressor a second chance and what will happen is um, the police department they're not going to come in and do that the prohibition period is going to stay for whatever the judge says after the hearing and we move on from there it also allows an immediate action to remove the access to firearms julia mentioned the provisions and some of the other uh, civil provisions where you have 24 hours to turn it in 48 hours to uh, show proof with the gvro the guns are taken right there on scene either through an EPO as soon as it's obtained and served, or through an ex parte where the packet and notice for hearing is served. But for law enforcement um, types of GVROs, there's no daylight between the service of the prohibition and the seizure of the weapon. And it's prohibited in the actual code itself that there be any kind of daylight. And uh, that, it makes sense. You don't want the government coming for your gun, sir. Um, you have two days to turn them in, otherwise you're gonna you know, commit a misdemeanor. What that would do is that would give the, after we've already established that you pose an immediate and present danger, 
uh, to a judicial standard. What that would create would be either it would accelerate any kind of plan to shoot or harm others if one existed. It would uh, maybe cause them to hide or relocate the firearms so that they cannot be surrendered or seized. Um, and in either one of those situations, we don't have that window of time in the GVRO like we do in others. You can file one during an investigation prior to a, a charges being reviewed. You can file one at any point during the pendency of a crime case, during a jury trial, uh, during the million continuances uh, that occur between the arraignment and the trial if it goes to the box, or even if a case is not issued or not filed, you can still file a GVRO because it's civil in nature. If it's reduced, if it's dismissed, um, you can file either way. It essentially takes an independent track to the crime case, but also serves as a gap filler. So that if whatever crimes are being charged or whatever stage of review it's in, and there's no prohibition, the GVRO will keep that person prohibited throughout the life of the case. Uh, people often ask, well, what if there's a 21 day right to a hearing? Obviously it can take a year to three years to file a crime case, what happens? Well, most judges and probably 99% of the petitioners who we filed on that do have a companion crime case, they trail the GVRO behind the crime case. Reason being is if they're gonna to go to hearing in the civil matter, they're gonna probably incriminate themselves when either I call the opposing party to testify or they elect to present their defense in their own words and most lawyers would frown upon that. So that's why they trail. What does it take to uh, file a GVRO? Now this is a lot, so I'm gonna kind of summarize here. These are the codified factors uh, when considering what you need to get a GVRO. I'm gonna start on the left side because the left side is everything that the judge shall consider if put before him or her at an evidentiary hearing. <clears throat> Any recent threat or act of violence by the respondent towards another or towards the self. Recent means six months, but I'll show you why at the end that's kind of arbitrary. The threat does not have to be a 422. The act does not need to constitute a crime. It's just any, uh, so every crime where a 422 is submitted and it was rejected because it didn't meet one of the elements, it wasn't communicated directly or uh, wasn't specific enough or whatever uh, those factors are, doesn't matter for this. If it's perceived as a threat, it's intended as a threat, it looks like a threat, we can use it. The next two are any violation of a uh, restraining order that's in effect and that lists all the code sections. Those code sections have to do with child abuse, stalking, civil harassment orders, dissuasion, or domestic violence. Any conviction listed in 29805, which is a whole laundry list of misdemeanors, 417s, 422s. Uh, if in the past convicted of those, there was a uh, prohibition that carried 10 years with that conviction, we can cite that here. Any pattern of violence in the last 12 months, then we move to the right side. Any unlawful or reckless use, display, or brandishing, that's kind of a no-brainer of a firearm, can be evidenced. Any use, attempted use, or threatened use of physical force, uh, any prior arrest for a felony, any history of a violation. If there was a restraining order that was a few years ago, it's long, long since expired, but there was a violation at that time, we can evidence it. Any documentary evidence uh, that shows controlled substance abuse or alcohol abuse, we can use in evidence. Oftentimes that's just a redacted rap sheet that shows a long history of uh, misdemeanor, unconvicted, non-prohibited people who are frequent flyers in the uh, realm of methamphetamine or uh, heroin. And then finally, any recent acquisition of firearms, ammunition or other deadly weapons. So most of the exclusionary rules that you would see in the crime side just don't apply here as you're going through these factors. And just to make sure, you know, the legislator and all of its wisdom said, hey, we're not gonna foresee every red flag and we don't wanna tie you down to this list of code factors. Um, so they put at the top of the right-hand side that the judge may consider any other evidence that shows an increased risk for violence. And once they do that, uh, we can articulate subsection two, we can put it in. Then there's the intangible factors. This is the MO of a mass shooter in the United States. We ripped this off from the feds when we uh, joined up with them after a presentation on the, um, the Vegas shooter. And interestingly in San Diego, we've applied this to when we do review for a GVRO, uh, 
whether it, misses, uh, whether it meets this MO. And if it does, we've argued it as a factor. And it's essentially people who feel a sense of failure, anger, and rage, non-value, they're, they're depressed, they feel insignificant, nobody respects them, often socially awkward or disconnected. They use violence as the remedy to fulfill the above. So they think if I can commit a mass shooting um, or shoot somebody, get myself in the news, I'll have respect, I'll have significance, I'll have value. And it's kind of a pressure release for their anger and rage. Now, um, in addition to like the, the school shooters or the workplace shooters, we often, we often see this MO in a lot of the juvenile GBROs that we file on, um, people who are going through some sort of crisis. And this is to distinguish from mental health. This has nothing to do with a mental health diagnosis, but more of just people in some sort of crisis. And there's a ton of values out, uh, resources out there for people in crisis. As far as domestic violence goes, uh, the code just in September of 2020, checking the time here, 2020 added domestic disturbance to the GBRO codes. Prior to that of September 2020, there was no mention of mental health, there was no mention of suicide, and there was no mention of domestic violence. It pretty much said in 18108 that the court, that the police officer shall consider a GBRO for domestic disturbances anywhere where there's a registered gun, a gun present, or any party possesses a gun. Now, this doesn't mean they have to file it. This just means they have to consider it. And I think that's part of the awareness and um, with the recent events in San Diego, uh, putting this in the cop's mind whenever there is a DV call where the hair on the back of your neck raises as this might be a little more serious than the average um, as far as the threat or the danger in an HRT type of case, no matter how difficult it is to prove or non-prove or no matter what the state of affairs is for the victim, and how cooperative they will or won't be, a GVRO can always be considered independent of that. And then should consider a GVRO for mental health or suicide. Um, I'm gonna end with a case study. This is kind of a good one here because, uh, and believe me, there's, there's so many we can, we can pull from, but this one involves both child abuse, domestic violence and reckless storage, uh, which I think was applicable for today. And this is a situation where, um, Essentially, a call comes in, it's a DV call, because the woman in the, the victim in this, she's being dragged down the stairs by her hair and kind of kicked around, pushed around, and there's five kids in the house at the time. The cops show up, but prior to the police showing up, the respondent takes a silver handgun, puts it in a box, leaves the scene. Police show up, when they show up, they're talking, taking statements from the, uh, the victim. And one of the kids has a contusion over his left eye that looks fairly fresh. Uh, he's about five years old. All of his siblings who are all under the age of 10, there's four others, four other siblings. They all rat out the uh, dad saying, dad hit him with a shoe last night. And that's why he's got the cut over his eye. So now child abuse rolls out. Um, they take statements from everybody. It goes through the, uh, the mechanisms of, of investigation and prosecution. At the end of the day, the victim recanted, would not cooperate, changed her story. The kids were considered too young to be reliable to testify as to what occurred and when it occurred, so no crime case was filed. But what's interesting about this is, as the cops were doing a safety sweep of the home, what do they find in clearing all the children out of that house? They find a shotgun, uh, a rifle, and an AK-47, just, just laying there under the bed, completely unsecured, up against the door in the bedroom uh, where the, uh, the mother and father slept, just to sit there, and then one in the closet just sitting there, completely unsecured. Those kids had unfettered access to these weapons um, had they wanted to. There was no locks on the parents' door or anything like that. So, um, and they had these guns for home protection. So we filed the GVRO. Um, we were able to cite all of the abuse uh, based on the reports and the statements that the police took because hearsay does come in. We were able to show the, the access and the reckless storage. This was before the reckless storage ordinance, so we couldn't really use that. But um, there was a lot of red flags here that involved history of violence on the kids, history of violence on the spouse. And uh, at the time, the, the suspect comes back when all the cops are on scene, pretty much like, hey, what's going on? Why is everybody here without the gun that he took with him? He was also a military member. Um, so we went to hearing and he 
he had letters from the DA's office, letters from the city attorney's office saying that they didn't file any charges, that he didn't do anything wrong. And we just played the BWC of the where the guns were secured and how the cops found them and just said, hey, we don't, we're not really here for the DV, although we're citing that as a factor. We're here for children having access and how that in itself poses a risk. Um, the judge uh, pretty much granted the GBRO and uh, that was that was it for him. So I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here. If you have any questions for me, clearly, you know, there's a lot more to this PowerPoint than, than I uh, scratched the surface on. And if you can reach out to me at any time, though, that's my desk number, my cell number, or my email. Um, I'm pretty easy to find through, I'm in the police uh, system too, through San Diego Police Department. You can find me through there. Um, okay, so I'm here to talk to you guys about victim rights and then local resources. Um, I'm going to start with, oops, sorry, I'm going to start with victim rights. So in November of 2008, the California um, voters, we passed what we commonly refer to as Marcy's Law. It's actually a victim's bill of rights, and it was an amendment to the California Constitution. So it officially codified um, rights that victims of crimes have. These are not specific to domestic violence victims or survivors, um, but they are um, any victim of a crime, uh, they have these rights. So I wanna highlight a few that I think are very important um, and just kind of talk about them and explain them a little bit. So first, victims have the right to be notified of all court proceedings. That seems really obvious, um, but unfortunately, there was a period of time where victims didn't have those rights. Um, so victims have a right to be notified about an arraignment, about a readiness conference, a preliminary hearing, a jury trial, all of that, um, all of those occasions victims can know about. They have a right to attend those hearings if they want. It's up to them. They do not have to attend. They have a right to be reasonably protected from the accused offender. Also something that I think is, people would expect, of course, they have a right to be protected from the person who just abused them or attacked them. Um, but again, that right didn't exist. It was not codified until 2008 in California. Um, victims have a right to refuse an interview and to set reasonable conditions on um, the conduct of any such interviews. In the domestic violence context, this is very important. Um, defense attorneys, of course, want to get um, victims interviewed and get statements from them. But in the DV context, um, that's a little bit difficult because sometimes the victim doesn't want to speak with the defense investigator. And in the state of California, the victim does not have to do that. They have the option. They can if they want, but they do not have to um, meet with or provide a statement with an investigator, a defense, defense investigator. They can decide, yes, I want to speak to them. I want to provide them a statement. However, I'd like to do it under these set conditions. And this is important. We don't want um, people who've been uh, abused to be harassed now once we have a criminal case um, in place. So that was a really important um, addition to the Bill of Rights. Victims have a right to prevent the disclosure of confidential information, confidential records, Police reports often have a host of information. They have CII numbers, so like um, criminal, criminal um, numbers. They have social security numbers, addresses, phone numbers, all sorts of things like that. Um, and oftentimes these are things that one, aren't discoverable. So it's not something that prosecutors have an obligation to turn over. Um, but also it's something that people don't want other people that have their social security number. It's just one more way that they can potentially be victimized. So we redact that information out in our cases. We make sure that their confidential information is not turned over and victims have that right. Um, they also have a right to information about the conviction, sentencing or imprisonment and release of an offender. They have a right to an order of restitution and restitution um, is basically a repayment for out-of-cost expenses or out-of-pocket expenses that a victim has suffered as a result of a crime. So think in the context of your, a car theft. Um, if their car was never recovered, then they have a right 
to reimbursement from that specific defendant to cover the cost of their loss. Um, in the DV context, medical records, or excuse me, medical um, bills can be very costly. Uh, they have a right to have repayment for those out-of-pocket expenses um, as a result of being in the hospital or whatever um, out-of-pocket expenses they did incur. I'll talk about in a little bit about the Victims' Compensation Fund because that is a great program that California has to help victims of crime, um, including in domestic violence contexts. Um, but just know that restitution is, is something that's out there. It's subject to the defendant making the payments, um, but it is something that victims have a right to. Um, what I think is one of the most important rights that a victim has is that they have a right to have input at sentencing. They also have a right to give a victim impact statement. So at the DA's office, um, before we make an offer uh, to the defense, we do talk to our victims if, if they want to be involved, and not all of them do, but if they want to be involved with us, um, we can let them know what the offer is, find out input from them before we make an offer. Um, and then at sentencing, victims have a right to actually stand up in court and provide a victim impact statement. They don't have to, it's completely up to them. But if they do that, then they're effectively giving a statement, they're telling the court and the defendant, um, you know, how this crime impacted them and what they'd like to see happen or anything that they just want to tell the court and the defendant. I have seen some very um, powerful victim impact statements and while not all victims do want uh, to give a victim impact statement, the ones that have, I think um, it seems to be a sense of closure for them. At that point, the criminal case is closed. So this is their last, the last thing on their mind. They get to explain, show that they have power, show that they can do this, tell the defendant exactly what this did to them, um, and then it's over then they're, they've got their closure and they're ready to move on after that. Finally, the last um, victim right that I wanna just touch on is that the victims have a right to be notified of these rights. And that's in the form of the pamphlet that you see on the screen. This is just one page of the pamphlet. Um, but when police respond to a 911 call, they contact the victim, they'll take a statement, they'll take a report, um, and they will provide the victim with a victim rights, a Marcy's, card, a Marcy's Law pamphlet. Um, sometimes it's going to be a victim advocate in South Bay. Uh, South Bay Community Services responds, uh, DVRT responds out um, to patrol and they'll provide them with resources as well. So victim safety, survivor safety is obviously our number one priority. And it's a little difficult to talk about uh, generalities when it comes to safety like this because each specific person is in a, their situation is just slightly different. So the one thing that I do wanna note is this safety planning, there is a phone number and a website where people can call and get help specifically in coming up with a safety plan for themselves. I would note if police respond and there's a domestic violence incident at the house and children were present, then uh, child welfare services will get notified. And typically, child welfare services will create and come up with a, a safety plan for uh, the family. Safety planning can be anything. Um, it can start with, what do you do when he, the perpetrator is starting to get angry and you know it's going to go bad from here? Where do you go? Who do you call? What do you do with the children? Do you have a to-go bag? Things like that. Again, everybody's situation is going to be different. And so I encourage you to reach out um, to this phone number or contact, uh, go to the website to get specific ideas for your position. Um, some generalities, so safety planning. It can be before there's a DV incident, a domestic violence incident. It can be during a DV incident and it can be after. So you do need to think about it in all three manners. Um, I'm right now focusing on what do we do after there's a domestic violence incident? Consider moving residences, if that's possible. Not everybody can just move, um, but if you're able to and you are concerned that the perpetrator is gonna come back, I would encourage you to consider moving. There are DV shelters in, Cal in San Diego, they're local ones, um, and 
the last slide will list a couple phone numbers for some DV shelters. There's also a 14 days notice and quit. So that is something for renters. If you own your house, obviously you don't have a lease, but if you are a renter and you are the victim of a domestic violence incident, then you can file a 14 days notice and quit um, to get out of that lease. You are on the hook for those 14 days for rent. You do have to pay for those 14 days, but after that, you can actually break the lease um, and move. So something to consider if you're able to move or if the, if the survivor is able to move. If they're not, um, then I would strongly encourage people to consider investing in surveillance cameras. Um, and the MDT programs that we did, we very often, this was like the first thing that we would talk about is do you have surveillance cameras? I'm very partial to Ring just because the quality of the video is so great um, and, it, and they maintain those, those recordings. Um, but any surveillance camera will work and at least help keep you a little bit safer. Consider changes in your routes to and from work. Anything that you did that you normally did, any patterns or habits you had, change them. Take different routes to work, take different routes to school. Um, the idea is if someone is following you, we wanna change things up so they don't know where to find you. Intimate part partner battering, they know you. Uh, they know your habits. Um, and so changing the things that we kind of take for granted, uh, changing those habits is going to be a big step um, in making sure that they're leaving you alone and you're safe. Consider having a safety word, um, whether it be with your best friend or your mom or um, even your work, consider a safety word. You can email or text uh, pineapple. I see pineapple a lot for some reason, I'm not sure why. Um, or pizza, text a word so that the person on the other line knows you need help. Um, because you might, the, the survivor at that point, if they're in the middle of something, they might not be able to call 911 and get help. And we want everyone to be safe. Also, make sure that the police are notified that the perpetrator has access to firearms or owns firearms. Um, I, I know that not everyone is very is super comfortable explaining to law enforcement the ins and outs of their relationship, or maybe they're not comfortable telling law enforcement that they do, their partner has a gun. When you bring guns into these crimes, everything is a little bit escalated. The, the ramifications are a little bit higher. Um, so I would, if you are a victim advocate who's listening to this or um, a Daffy nurse or anything like that, someone who, who is dealing with and working with survivors, ask, ask the question if the perpetrator has a firearm, if they have access to it. Um, because we wanna get those guns, as everyone has said, we wanna get those guns out of the houses and away from the perpetrators. Finally, restraining orders. Of course, consider getting a restraining order. There are a ton of types of restraining orders. Um, the ones that are in red on your screen are the ones that are going to most appropriately deal with domestic violence or impact domestic violence cases. Emergency protective order, we call them EPOs, temporary restraining order, or OAH, that's an order after a hearing. Uh, criminal protective order, it attaches to the criminal case so if there is a criminal case um, that is filed, then at arraignment, we will ask for a criminal protective order. It's the same thing as a civil restraining order. It just is attached to the criminal case. I know that we talked, um, or Julia mentioned, um, that DAs and, and law enforcement need to actively be looking um, into whether people have uh, firearms at an early stage. And I did just want to, to let everyone know uh, that at arraignment, when we're asking for a criminal protective order, one of our paralegals has actually already run um, their name and information in the gun database to see if there's a registered firearm to that individual. Again, it's only if it's registered to them, so there is unfortunately a loophole, um, but that is done before arraignment. So by the time I come to in front of the judge and I'm getting ready to tell the court you know, what I want for bail and that I'd like a criminal protective order, I also know he has a firearm registered to him and then we have a procedure in place um, to get the firearm 
uh, turned into law enforcement or a licensed gun dealer. Um, they have to come back to the court, I think it's 48 hours after they're released from custody with proof that that firearm is somewhere else. Or unfortunately, a lot of times we hear that the firearm has been lost or it was stolen 10 years ago. Um, there's a process that they fill out some paperwork under the penalty of perjury um, explaining what happened to the firearm. So emergency protective orders, it's an EPO. Law enforcement are the only people who can um, request an emergency protective order. 911 call happens, police respond, uh, they take a, a crime report for a domestic violence incident, and then they um, can, will ask the victim if they want an emergency protective order. Um, I say they ask them, that's not the end all be all because only law enforcement can request an em emergency protective order. It is issued by a judge. Um, the judge is available 24 seven. So those 3 a.m. calls uh, that law enforcement get, they can still get an emergency protective order even though it's Saturday morning at 3 a.m. It can still happen. It's issued orally, telephonically or otherwise. Um, the in order to get a, an EPO, the law enforcement officer and the judge have to believe that there's reasonable grounds to believe that immediate and present danger of domestic violence or a couple other offenses. They also have to believe that the EPO is necessary to prevent the abuse and the victim's consent is not required. So even if a, the victim does not want an emergency protective order, law enforcement can still get one. These are valid, EPOs are valid for five court days or seven business days. They're meant to be short and sweet. Um, they basically cover an incident happened Friday at 6 p.m. So the courthouse is closed. It's gonna cover so that by the time we get into the next week, you have protection and time to go get an actual temporary restraining order. It can be issued even if the protective party is no longer at the residence. So if the survivor, goes, decides to go with family in Arizona, they can still get an emergency protective order. And it can, I don't see this very often, I don't actually know that I've ever seen it, but they technically can include child custody orders and they can prevent the restrained party from getting address location, um, getting address and location, excuse me, of the protected party. So why get a restraining order? The most obvious reason is to protect the victim. Um, it also helps to control the suspect's behavior, behavior. It can help law enforcement too. So it provides law enforcement with a way to enforce um, what otherwise might not be criminal behavior. So a situation, uh, there's a domestic violence incident on a Friday night. Couple lives together. Um, the perpetrator gets arrested goes into, and goes to jail. Uh, victim does not want an emergency protective order and law enforcement does not seek one on their own. When the perpetrator, let's say he bails out over the weekend, so before criminal charges are filed, he bails out and he goes back to the home, he's pounding on the door, trying to get in. Law enforcement are going to show up and they're going to say it's a civil issue. There's no restraining order, there's no emergency protective order, he's not committing a new crime and he has a right to be at that location. So something to consider um, when you're talking with survivors on about restraining orders, I would encourage them if their safety is at risk, I would encourage them, especially if a recent domestic violence incident happened to get an emergency protective order and to follow through and go get a temporary restraining order and then an order after hearing. It also can um, increase future penalties. For example, if there's a criminal protective order or a restraining order in place, and now they've used violence or threat of violence, that can bump that crime, what would be a misdemeanor, it can bump it up to a felony. And then it can also um, help document a stalking case. So stalking cases are notoriously difficult, um, but when you start seeing a pattern, because stalking is pattern behavior, when you start seeing a pattern of multiple restraining order violations, it's showing the victim is scared, doesn't wanna be around the suspect, and so it does help build stalking cases. If the suspect is in custody at the time that you get a temporary restraining order, get him served ASAP. 
the sheriff's department will actually serve him before he's released from custody. That's if the survivor goes and gets the restraining order while he's still in custody. And I use he and she a lot and I, those are completely interchangeable. So please don't take that as me um, indicating one way or another who a defendant always is, what gender a defendant is. Um, that's just, gen it's easier to generalize or it's easier to just pick um, a gender. So get him served. If the suspect is in custody, get him served as soon as possible. Um, people are very good at evading service once they're out of custody. So get him served while they're there. And the biggest thing about getting a restraining order is the perpetrator, the defendant, the suspect cannot have a firearm. He has 48, 24 to 48 hours to turn that firearm in or get it to a licensed gun dealer. And it is a misdemeanor to try to get a gun while a restraining order is in place. There is an exception. I know they kind of touched on this earlier. There are exceptions for employment. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second because specifically for peace officers. Um, but if a court does not order a criminal protective order in a domestic violence case, the court still can, they shall consider issuing um, an order that requires the defendant to relinquish their weapons. Um, I will say I have yet to see a, a situation where the court does not impose a criminal protective order when the DA is asking for it and the victim wants it. So that's just my side note. I, if the victim wants it and the prosecutor is asking for it, I have always seen the judge issue it. That's not that it's never happened. It's just in my experience, um, we get criminal protective orders. So I talked um, a second ago about some exceptions, so an exception to the no firearm. Um, one of the things I think is really great in the law is that you can't, so if you are the, the protected party in a, in a restraining order, you cannot agree to let the defendant or the perpetrator, the restrained party, um, you can't agree to let him have his guns. And this makes sense, especially when we're talking about a domestic violence context. We don't want someone who has power and control, who has been trying to exert power and control over that survivor um, to be able to manhandle the, the survivor into agreeing to give their guns back. So just note, I've seen people try to do that before. You can't agree to it. Even in the criminal arena too, you can't agree to giving his guns back. The court may grant an, accept, an exemption if the firearm is necessary as a condition of employment and the employer is unable to reassign the defendant to a position where a firearm is unnecessary. Um, for peace officers, they do have to undergo a psychological evaluation and the court has to find that the officer does not pose um, a threat. Domestic violence clinics are um, at every courthouse. They have their own clinics. Um, you can file for a restraining order at no cost. Um, these clinics, like I said, are at each, uh, each of the courthouses. So South Bay, East County, Central, and Vista, they all have their own clinics. This website will actually give you the hours that uh, for those clinics. They change, especially during COVID. I would encourage you to check it out before you go um, to try to get a restraining order. Check out the hours, make sure um, that they're open when you're trying to go. And then if you need more information on obtaining a restraining order, the Sheriff's Department at this um, address, they have a lot of information there. Arrive early, especially if you yourself are going for a restraining order or you're going to support someone else. Um, arrive early and be ready to spend the day there. So don't have any appointments in the afternoon um, because sometimes it will take all day. Make sure you're there early before the DV clinic closes and then things to bring. So you're gonna to need to bring the perpetrator's address, his date of birth or her date of birth, um, any physical descriptor, descriptions of that person, photographs of any of your injuries if you have, if there are any, and then a copy of the police report if you have, uh, if you filed a police report. You do not need to file a police report in order to request a restraining order. Uh, if there's a police report, you can get a copy free from the police agency you need to, I would start by calling them because of COVID, but under normal circumstances, I would say go to the police station and to let them know you're a victim of domestic violence and um, that you would like a copy of that, that police report. 
because you're going to want to include the police report in your restraining order request. So how can others help? Um, again, code word or safety word. Um, and then having a photograph of the perpetrator, um, whether you're at an apartment complex where you have a security, um, a security guard, make sure they have a photograph of that perpetrator at work. A lot of people have to go through security in order to get to their actual office. Make sure whoever at that security guard is that they have a photo. Make sure that people that you work with know what that person looks like so they know if that person's there at your workplace. Consider a buddy system for walking your employee um, or your friend or whoever it is to and from um, their car in the parking lot. So this is all safety planning. Um, and then just offer your support. Learn about the cycle of violence. Try to understand the psyche behind um, some of this, you know, domestic violence crimes. Uh, learn about the signs of domestic violence, um, power and control, um, you know, jealous behavior, controlling behavior, things like that. Keep an eye open for that. Um, and then if you're an employer and you're concerned uh, for your employee, you can consider getting a workplace violence order. And I'm sorry, I'm going to jump really quickly into domestic violence, um, what to look for and how to leave safely. This is just from one of our pamphlets. Um, I think it breaks it down pretty well. The most dangerous time in a uh, DV victim's, um, the most dangerous time for them, quite frankly, is, is when they're trying to leave. So you wanna make sure that you as a friend or you as the survivor have planned this out and are doing everything safely. So things to consider are up on the screen. But now I'm gonna jump back, so sorry about that. I'm gonna jump back to workplace violence orders. Uh, this must be requested by an employer on behalf of the employee. The employee themselves, so the, the DV survivor, they cannot request this. This has to come from the employer. What's required is that the employee has suffered some sort of violence or credible threat of violence, and it either has to be reasonably foreseen to be at the workplace or it has been carried out at the workplace. Initially, people might think, well, that probably never happens. It actually happens more often than you think, whether it's that they're calling them while the, vic while the victim's at work, calling them, threatening them, trying to get them to come outside. Maybe it's they forcibly go in and drag them home. Um, there's usually, there's very often, I should say, a tie to the workplace. Um, so just, you just need to think about, well, what has happened? Um, has the, the perpetrator contacted the victim at their workplace before and been aggressive or violent with them? It, they likely have. The temporary one, it usually lasts 15 to 25 days, and then you have to go to an order after hearing, which would be valid for up to three years. And that would keep um, the restrained party from going to the workplace, calling and harassing the victims, things like that. Local resources. And I'm gonna go quickly because I don't have a ton of time. Uh, Safe at Home. This is a program where you can get confidential mailing address. Um, it's no cost to the person who signs up for it. It allows you to safeguard your address. So when you leave and you're trying to make sure that the perpetrator or the restrained party is not contacting you, this is a great resource. Sign up for it so that your mail can get sent um, safely. Whether it's your filing, for government documents, trying to enroll your, a child in school, things like that. Um, here's the phone number to get set up for that. And then of course, here is the um, website where you can also sign up for this program. Inmate notifications. This is really important because people get released from custody at all hours of the day. Um, Vine allows you to be notified when an inmate is going to be released or is being transferred. There's a phone number here, and as well as a website that you can register um, for notification. They'll email you to let you know that this person is set to be released at this date or on this date. Um, who's in jail? Um, there's the website up on the screen. You log in, well, you don't actually have to log in. So you go to the website, you type in the person's name, hit enter, and if they're in custody in San Diego County, it will tell you. It is strictly a San Diego County search tool. And then the DA's office. My office has a, a place where you can log in, uh, where you can, excuse me, sign up for notifications about certain cases. So you can find out what happened at various court hearings. 
Victims Compensation Program is a program where you can um, get repayment for out-of-pocket expenses, think medical bills, and then resources. 24 hours a day hotline, there's a list of them, um, as well as some um, DV shelters. And then additional phone numbers um, for services. 